We're excited to welcome back a gentleman whose research has been cited in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? How many of you remember that movie? It was a phenomenal, groundbreaking movie that really uh, got a lot of individuals' attention, including my own. He's also uh, been recognized by Deepak Chopra and Conversations with God author Neil Donald Walsh. He's been on numerous uh, radio and television shows and has taught more than 30,000 people, more than 30,000 people, how to manifest their dreams by releasing their intentions. Please join me in welcoming back to Unity on the Bay with warmth and with love, Dr. Garland Landreth. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. You know, this is one of my favorite churches. And I've been in a lot of churches. And um, what I love about this church is the collective consciousness. There's a movement here. There's an attitude. There's a feeling here. And it's really represented by Reverend Chris. I hadn't had a chance to meet him until a year ago. But I'd heard of him through other people who'd been inspired by him to go on the spiritual path. Other ministers told me they, he was one of the fundamental forces that had been in their, li his li their lives to become a minister. So I, I had a lot of good results and, from people that heard about it. And they can see by the collective conscience of this group that it's all coming into motion. Now today we're going to talk about why do bad things happen to good people with a quantum twist. And the quantum twist is huge. But we're going to first talk about this bad thing stuff. And hundreds of books have been written on this topic. As a matter of fact, Unity Church was founded on a bad thing. Myrtle Fillmore, one of the co-founders, she had tuberculosis, which was the death sentence around the 1900s, early 1900s, when she had it. And she healed herself. A miracle. How she did it, she did it with two different techniques. The first one was she forgave every part of her body. Not just the disease part, but every part. Little pinkies, you name it. I found that fascinating. But what's even more fascinating was she forgave the negative thoughts she had about her disease. She forgave her negative thoughts. Very timely with what we're going through right now. In order to understand this thing of negative thoughts, we've got to explore the quantum. So I want to spend a little time kind of playing in the quantum a little bit and explaining that to you. And the quantum is the place where miracles happen all the time. Just like Myrtle Filmer created a miracle by forgiving her th negative thoughts, quantum physics finds miracles all the time. For instance, let me give you an example. An object can't be in two different places at the same time, right? Wrong. When nobody's watching an electron, it magically turns into energy waves. So it's everywhere at the same time. How about this one? Einstein's law of relativity. The fundamental pillar upon which that rests is the idea that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Well, in 1931, two very famous physicists by, Schroeder, by the name of Schrodinger and Heidelberg proposed a theory called quantum entanglement which is, if you got a couple electrons circling an atom, they become beyond time and space. They have no limitations. So even if you were to separate them by a million miles, you push on one, the other would instantaneously go in the exact direction. In fact, so instantaneously, if you were to measure it, it'd be faster than the speed of light. Einstein hated this theory. <laughs> at one point, he called it spooky action at a distance, because it violated his law. Well, in 1981, they proved it. Einstein was proven wrong. And then they redid the experiment a couple of years ago in Switzerland. They found that not only did two electrons communicate faster than the speed of light, it was 10,000 times faster than the speed of light. If you're going to break a law of nature, you might as well go all the way. <laughs> but the spookiest thing about physics is the idea that consciousness itself is the quantum field. This is huge. Consciousness itself is the quantum field. Now, most of you have seen the movie What to Bleep, so I'm going to use one of the analogies there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's very complex, and they didn't really do a good job of explaining it in the movie. But I want to at least give you a taste of it so you get an idea of what's going on. I'll use some analogies. So don't 
but let it bother if you don't really understand it that well. But remember that scene where they were shooting that electron through a slit and they were lining up in the back wall, these ni nice, neat, nice, neat line of electrons? And there was an eye watching. The eye represented consciousness. So as long as the consciousness was there, the little balls stayed balls. As soon as the consciousness went away, there were 16 lines. How can one line turn into 16 lines? That doesn't make any sense, okay? So what happened was this. When the consciousness goes away, matter turns into energy. So matter and energy are part of the same whole. So you need consciousness collapsing energy into particles. So that's what they discovered. It's kind of like dropping a couple pebbles in the pond. If it, they produce waves, and the waves hit each other, they produce new waves, and then they hit each other, they produce new waves. Pretty soon you got 16 waves. That's the same kind of thing. So energy and particles are the same thing, just consciousness creates them. So what does this mean? It means without consciousness you can't have people. You can't have galaxies, you can't have stars, because you can't have particles. So what it means is there has to be a universal consciousness somewhere that's collapsing energy waves into particles. I think physics has discovered God. Amazing. Now, we have consciousness. Is our consciousness the same as that unbounded state? Well, I want to explain a couple, a couple of those angles. First of all, the power of prayer. Now, we all know the power of prayer. In fact, Unity Church has been involved with many of the most amazing studies. And most people think that prayer is positive thinking, right? At least most scientists do. But is prayer just positive thinking or is it something else? Think about it. We know the value of positive thinking. You can't be coming to this church with Reverend Chris and Reverend Juan and Jason, all those amazing people here, and not know the value of positive thinking. But is it just positive thinking or is it something else? It is. Well, maybe not. They did a study, and Unity Church was involved in this study, they had people who were being prayed for who didn't know they were being prayed for. So let's say I'm sick, and Reverend Chris is praying for me, and I get well faster because she's praying for me. And he doesn't tell me. If he doesn't tell me, I can't know. There's no positive thoughts, right? Guess what? I get well anyway. Well, they did a whole study like this, and Unity Church was involved with it. It was done in Kansas City, which is the home of Unity. They had prayed for everybody that entered the hospital over a three-month period. 1,600 people, and half prayed for, half not prayed for. Guess what? Same results as all the other prayer research studies, 250 of them. Less need for antibiotics, better quality of life, some cases less deaths, all kinds of amazing things happen. In other words, prayer is not just positive thinking, it's something else. Maybe kind of one of those quantum things. And the, and the interesting thing about prayer is, there is no energy emanating from your brain that can account for these amazing results. The electromagnetic field in your brain doesn't get past your skull bone. So how can praying for people 100 feet away, much less 1,000 feet away, work? It doesn't make any sense. It's one of those spooky action at a distance kind of things. Now, the, this relates back to the meditation research, the research that I was involved with. Those of you who saw the movie, um, I did the first studies way back in the 1980s, and we took 4,000 transcendental meditators into Washington as a demonstration project to prove that we could make it work. We could do it anytime, any place. That's how sure we were it would work. And then we sat there, we meditated, and um, people always ask us, how did you do it? How did you reduce those crime rates? We must have been thinking about crimes. You can't reduce crime rates without thinking about crimes, right? She says, no, okay? Anybody guess how we did it? We never once thought about crimes. Because when you want something, you're attracting lack. You're coming from a place of lack. Instead, what we did is we surrendered the results. Guess who said that? That's a quote from Charles Filmer, co-founder of Unity Church. Surrender the results. Get out of the way. We let the divine flow through us. We got out of the way. We surrendered. And the other part of this equation, though, is that 
what this research means between the prayer research and the meditation research is that we're all connected. What we do inside can make a huge difference in the outside world, okay? Now, so let's, but this also proves that we're quantum beings. So how come we're not living it as much as we should be? How come we're not living as well as we should be? You've got to be blocked. One of the questions I've asked all my, all my classes, most of them with unity people, unitics, I call them unitics. <laughs> and um, I ask people, how many people had dreams that have come true? And usually about 50% of the people, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good, about 50% raise their hands. And the ones, then I asked them about deja vu experiences. And a deja vu experience is a dream that's come true, but you don't remember the dream. And the rest of the hands go up. If we have that kind of ability on this side, can you imagine the kind of ability we have on the other side? We must have known the messes we were going to get ourselves into before we even came here. Because we're quantum beings. Does that make sense? Okay, so we chose them. We chose them. Now, one of my favorite psychics of all time, Vincent, he came to visit us when we lived in New York. He was a New Yorker. And um, he told me when I was 17 year old that I was going to be doing this amazing research, psychic research. He said he wanted me to send him some of it. And I told him about my dreams that would come true. And he said, yes, he had the dreams that came true as well, but he would have them during the day so that he were like visions. He could, that's how he could tell the future. I said, fascinating. And I said, so, uh, and, he was, and he was investigated by St. Joe's Hospital in New York City. And he was able to diagnose people that they couldn't even figure out what was wrong with them. And then they tried him in horse races. He got 100% of them right. I've never, seen this, I've never seen a psychic anywhere close to that. Well, anyway, a few years, a bunch of years later, I got my PhD and I thought, oh my God, I, I, gotta, I did the research. That was the main thing. I had to call Vincent up. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to hear him. You know, he would probably be tickled pink. So I called up and couldn't, I couldn't find him anywhere. Here's a world-class psychic disappeared. Doesn't make any sense. Finally, I got a hold of his brother. He had died of AIDS. He couldn't see his own stuff. I bet you everybody in here is really, really good at figuring out other people's stuff, <laughs> but not so good at figuring out your own stuff. We're all blocked. We're all blocked. But there, maybe there's a reason for these blocks. Maybe we're on a mission. Betty Eady had the best life after death experience I've ever, I've ever heard about. She wrote a whole bunch of books, Embraced by Light, a whole bunch after that. She was on the operating table, you know, the classic story. And uh, she died. Nobody even knew she died. She was dead for a little while. She left her body, and she went traveling around. She first visited her husband with the kids, and he was having problems getting to bed. And then she visited her doctor, and her doctor was getting ready for a golf trip. And, and that kind of collaborated what she had to say later on because it was things that actually happened. And then she went to the light. And the first person she meets when the light was Jesus. And she asked Jesus, why do bad things happen to good people? And Jesus says, well, he just laughed. You see that guy down in the street? She said, yes, he's, he's a bum. No, he's on a mission. He's on a mission. In about 15 minutes, a very famous lawyer is going to come walking by. Their eyes are going to meet, and the lawyer is going to change his life so he devotes his life to humanity, help making the world a better place. He's on a mission. Maybe we're on a mission. Maybe the bad things that happen to us were, are for a reason. They're for a reason. Because maybe our mission is to help the world become a better place. I bet you everybody in here has, that's their mission. You couldn't be coming to Unity Church without wanting to see improvements. So how are you going to make the world a better place without knowing about pain? Because there is no pain on the other side. You have to explore pain so you can help other people with their pain. You get that? Does that make sense? Right, like a drug addict. Drug addict can help another drug addict much better than somebody who's never been a drug addict. He has a talent. He's healed himself. The, I have talked to 
Out of thousands and thousands and thousands of clients I've had, I've had hundreds of women who've been abused and have had kids. I ask them one question. Would you throw away those kids to, re- to get rid of that abuse? No woman has ever said that because the kids were the best thing that ever happened to them. So in spite of the pain, there was so much beauty. It's like a mother with her baby. She doesn't care if the baby makes a mistake. She loves him or hear her anyway. We've got to learn to love each other if we have different points of view. This is huge. This is huge. Now, so maybe what we decided to do was help humanity and be alive at this very critical part in our human time. Because this is an opportunity for us to make a difference by loving. And that's, I think, the great truth that Myrtle Fillmore gave us about the bad versus the good, whatever. I had a, um, kind of related to this, I heard a Unity minister give a talk at a Unity convention. And he, had, he couldn't forgive the guy that killed his wife. Only when he was able to forgive did that huge black cloud lift him. Because when we hate other people, when we have negative thoughts, we have a black cloud around us. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. I didn't create this, this universe. So that's what Myrtle Fillmore taught us. You want to forgive because you can't love until you forgive. You have to be able to forgive in order to love. Okay? Does it make sense? Right. And that's what she did. In Myrtle Fillmore's case, her disease was her healing. She had started a whole huge unity church because she learned the secret of shifting a negative thought into a positive thought. The power of forgiveness into love. Into love. We came down here to experience the human experience, which by design is not going to be perfect. If we want perfect, you've got to stay on the other side. We didn't come down here for perfect. I think the real truth of all truths is this. The human experience is made for us to love the dark side. Because love is not complete until you love the dark side. Because without darkness, you can't have light. It's easy to love the light on the other side. But we've got to have darkness in order to have light. They're both part and parcel of the same whole. It's like Reverend Chris mentions oneness, which I, I love when he talks about that. When you are devoted to God, as wonderful as that is, you're still separate from God. God is out there and we're here. There is another experience, union, oneness, unity, unity with God. And it's a different kind of experience. So my mother, she came down with cancer of the colon. It spread to her bones. She spread, it spread to her um, uh, liver. I think it was also her lungs. They told her she's going to live for three months. She decided she wasn't going to go out on the cancer's terms. She was going to go out on her terms. She did the anti-cancer diet. She did the Ayurvedic herbs from India, which in India they have one-tenth the cancer rates we do here. She also did prayer. She also did meditation. And when I took her to the hospital, the people who had her same disease were basket cases. Nobody even knew she was sick until about two weeks before she decided to pass on. She would, did all her stuff on her bucket list. And what she told me was, before she passed on, cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned to love, my, love, love every moment of every day completely. I lived my life fully every moment of the day. And having worked on lots of cancer, I can tell you it's usually a a spiritual journey. 
It's an amazing spiritual journey. We need to learn to love even our diseases. Because we, the law of attraction has nothing to do with what you want. It has everything to do with attracting who we are. Now, the beautiful summary of this whole thing is that if we want to change the outside world, we don't have to do much except change the inner world because we're all connected. That's what this research is proving. That's what this research is proving. We don't have to change the world by trying to change other people. And it's working. Just the other day, I saw another, uh, another um, what is it, it's a poll on gay marriage. 65% of the people are not for gay marriage in America. Just two and a half years ago, 65 were against it, and all our presidents were against it. There's been a shift in the collective consciousness, a shift. And we're creating it by meditating and prayer and feeling love. We don't, we don't, have, to, we don't have to go outside to change the outside. It doesn't work that well. So that what we're moving, this whole humanity is moving in a direction of greater compassion and greater love. And I can name a hundred different things that can prove that we're moving in that direction. So it's, it's wonderful what we're going through. It's the most exciting time we've ever been alive. And science is actually proving spirituality now. This is a blessing. Because I will tell you this, having worked with thousands and thousands of people, everybody has doubts. We all got them at one time or another. It is so refreshing to be living in a time when science is proving spirituality. And we have a lot to be grateful for. It's a very exciting time if you're a healer because there's a lot of need right now. There's a lot of love that you can share. And many of us came down to be healers, so that's why we go through so much pain. So we can be a better healer. We can understand and we can be there for people. It's a very exciting time. Thank you so much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.